Y'all, I got a text. I've got some friends. I have some good and faithful brothers in Christ, other ministers at other churches in different parts of the country uh, that are faithful in praying for me. And I th I'm very thankful for that. And I would encourage you, if you don't have that, get that. You need lots of people praying for you. And I had the pleasure this morning of responding to two texts saying, praying for you this morning, brother, as you preach God's word, may the spirit be with you uh, and, and all of the people uh, in your congregation. And uh, I got to say, today is a full day. We get all the means of grace in one service, right? We have baptism. We have, uh, we have the preaching of God's word. We have prayer. We have the Lord's Supper. It's an exciting day. So we're now turning to the preaching of God's word, which is also a means of grace to us for our growth, for our spiritual nourishment. And we've been in chapters five through seven talking a lot about how Jesus is a better high priest, okay? Just bringing us up to speed as we begin chapter eight this morning. Last week, we said that the author understands this idea of Jesus being their high priest is a difficult concept for them to grasp. And so he's actually taking his time. He's taking great pains to prove it to them, all right? He says Jesus isn't disqualified from being a high priest just because he's not of the line of Aaron. No, in fact, he's a higher high priest because he's not of the line of Aaron. He is sinless. He is eternal. He is kingly. He represents both God and man in the sacrifice that he offered, and it's himself that he offered. So remember, they, these, his audience here, they've been flirting with the idea of going back to the old familiar ways of Judaism, and that included the sacrificial system. And so the author, what he's doing here is he's really, he's really stacking things up here. It's like he's blocking off all the exits to keep them on this highway of faith. He says, you're looking to the priests who couldn't get the job done. You know they couldn't get it done. They were only there to show you your need for someone who could get it done. And that's Jesus. And then here, as we'll see, he ties it all up, and then he starts talking about a new and better covenant that Jesus brings. And all of the covenant stuff specifically, we'll actually start looking at and talking about next week. But here's the punch he throws next, trying to drive home this point of how much better a high priest Jesus truly is. Okay, we're in chapter 8, looking at just the first six verses this morning. Beginning at verse 1, now hear the words of the one living and true God. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. It is to be sought after as for treasure. It is better than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. God, we thank you that your word endures forever. We thank you for the privilege it is to hear it this morning. God, I pray that you would be with me as I trust you have been in the preparation of this sermon and the delivery of it so that people may hear your word, your truth, that they would understand it by your spirit and lightening their minds. God, we pray that all of this would be done for your glory, for the good of your church. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the author begins there. Now, the point in what we're saying is this, and that's always nice because we don't have to guess, right? No, no problem to solve here. 
He tells us. We're getting all these deep theological concepts and ideas thrown at us in Hebrews, and it's hard to keep up with all of them. So he says, here's the point. Jesus sat down. He's not like the Old Testament priests who were running around and making sacrifices all all the time and, and their work was never done. No, his work is done. It's finished. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven. So what we want to look at here is the significance of that. Where he sat down and why he sat down. And as crazy as that sounds... Those will be your two points this morning because it's, it's easy to get a hold of. It's easier to, to understand and to remember and to grab on to what he's laying down here. He says, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven. That's where he sat down. He's a minister in the holy places, verse two, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. That's where, not on earth. If he were on earth, verse 4, he would not be a priest at all, it says. Okay, so why? Why is he seated? Because his work is finished. So all the Old Testament priests and the sacrifices they offered were copies and shadows, verse 5, of the heavenly things. What you needed to be reconciled to God was someone to bring you into the presence of God and represent you there. The Old Testament priests couldn't do it. They were a placeholder for the one who could, and he's already come, and his work is finished. That's why he sat down. And that's exciting. Right? That, that should be exciting. We don't want to be snoozing in here this morning hearing exciting news like this. That's exciting news. You know, it's not, it's not for somebody who thinks they've got it all together who's still trying to be righteous enough to earn God's love. It wouldn't be exciting for them. It'd be boring. But for those who recognize that they are sinners in the eyes of a holy and just God who made them, this is refreshing because they know there's no such thing as no relationship with God. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as no relationship with God. That's not the problem. The problem is everybody has a relationship with God. It's a bad one. We're forever separated from the love of God and fellowship with him unless, unless a perfect man did what we were supposed to do and died in our place because we didn't. If only there was a sinless, stainless man with innocent blood in his veins who is willing to offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins we've committed, then God could accept us. Then we could be forgiven. If only. The author says, that's the high priest you have. We have such a high priest, verse 1. One who is seated. What's the significance of that in their minds? Well, let's look at where he sat down, okay? Where Jesus sat down. And again, I know the points sound funny. Where he sat down, why he sat down. Again, you're going to see how this how this plays into their understanding of this this high priest, the significance of this. This is all presence language here in verse 2. Okay, The where is important. Where he sat down is really important. We can't miss this. This is all presence language. Right hand of the throne, minister in the holy places, in the true tent, All of this is saying Jesus does his ministry as a high priest in a better location. He offers a better sacrifice in a better location. You getting that? This true tent here is different than the tent they're used to meeting God in. They had that. God said he would meet his people in a tabernacle, in a tent of meeting. This was the place where God said he would make his presence manifest, where he would draw near to his people, where he would meet with and speak to his mediator. But Jesus doesn't meet God there. Doesn't have to. He meets God where he is, in heaven. All right, so not a man-made tent, but in the very presence of God. And there, God accepts his sacrifice. 
once and for all. That means it worked. That, that, that means there, there's no more sacrifice to be made. Remember, the Old Testament priests would bring the blood of the sacrifice into the tent where God said he would be. And y'all, it's not like God wasn't there. It's not like he said, oh, I'll be there and never showed up. No, he was. He was present there in a sense. And God's everywhere. He's omnipresent. There's no place that he's not. That's all true. And he promised his presence would especially be with his people in their midst, in the tent, in the tabernacle. And that's where the blood of the sacrifice had to be brought by the priest for the sins of the people. So what's wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing wrong with that. But that's not the right question. The right question is, why wasn't that sufficient? Why didn't it work? Why doesn't that solve my sin problem? What's missing? and the blood of bulls and goats to atone for my sin. And here's the answer. He gives it there in verse 5. Because it was a copy and a shadow. You think about a shadow. It's not fake. It's not phony. You know, it belongs to the real thing. It's it's just not the real thing. You look at a person's shadow, you think about this, you can make a lot out about, about a shadow. You can look at a person's shadow and you can find out some information about the thing that shadow represents. You can kind of tell by looking at it if it's a, if it's a, if it's a woman or if it's a man, uh, about how tall or short they are, how big they are, how large a stature of a person it is, whether they have long hair, whether they have short hair. Right? There's a lot of information that you can get from looking at the shadow and all of that is true but you're not getting the full picture. You know, I told my wife this morning, uh, who's not here, we, our youngest is feeling a little under the weather today. But I was telling her, it's like, you know, imagine me being so enthralled with your shadow. My wife is a beautiful woman. She casts a striking shadow. But I don't want to just stare at her shadow. I wouldn't be content with that. I want to see her face. Right? I want to see her eyes. I want to see her smile. I want to see all those wonderful features that God has etched into her profile, to her face, and enjoy that and take all of that in. She's there in living color. And so that's what this is like. The shadow isn't fake. It's not bad. It's just, what if you could see the real person? If you could see the real person, the thing that the shadow represents, why would you go back to the shadow? And further, you can't have a relationship with a person's shadow. But you can have a relationship with them, the one that shadow represents. And so the tent was a man-made tent that was symbolic of the dwelling place of God, where Jesus is. And we've said this already in recent sermons, but you need a high priest that can get you all the way in to the very presence of God. And we have such a high priest, the author says. Jesus does his work as a high priest in the very presence of God, in the true holy of holies. He's a minister in the holy places, it says, verse 2. Holy places we only had a vague idea of before, right? The holy places that we could only see the shadow of cast down on earth from heaven to get some idea of what they must be like. God gave Moses very specific instructions back in Exodus 25 on, on how to do that. He says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst exactly as I have shown you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle. And the author of Hebrews picks up on that here. So that's as close as we could get then. But we can get closer now. Jesus comes into the real presence of God with his own blood to offer himself as a better sacrifice in a better location for the sins of his people. And he continues as our high priest interceding for his people there. All right, so that's where he sat down. Now let's move into why he sat down. First thing to realize is Jesus sat down as both priest and king. He sat down as both priest and king. God's people 
needed a change in regime. They'd been needing that desperately for some time. They needed a righteous man to be their king forever, to rule and to defend them. They, 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 had, some, they had some good kings, right? They did have some, but they had a whole lot of bad ones, if you remember. You know, it's interesting, during our uh, family worship time in, in recent months, we've gone through First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. We're almost done with Second Kings now. And my sons, they get a real sense of this as we're reading through that. Uh, that, that they, they need a righteous king. That's what they're after. And God promised that they would have one eventually. He promised that they would have one. But along the way, we keep hearing over and over and over again, so-and-so became king in Israel and reigned for so many years, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. I think there's something like 39 kings we read about there. And there were only eight good ones, and they all came from the southern kingdom of Judah. And so my boys, as we've been reading through this, even at their young age, they start to perk up. They start to get excited when they hear so-and-so, king of Judah, began to reign, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And they, <gasps> the eyes get big, and they're hanging on, and then the thing that it says next, nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. There was still allowed this, this worship of pagans and the, the pe God's people still chased after idols. And everyone busts out, oh man. And the whole, it just puts a drag on the whole thing as we're reading it. It's a ton of fun. But we just read 2 Kings 18 recently where King Hezekiah comes to the throne, becomes king of Judah. And it says, he did remove the high places and he broke down the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And the boys are like, yes, finally. But even that was temporary. Hezekiah wasn't perfect. Actually ends up making some costly mistakes. And just like all the other kings before him, Hezekiah dies. And the very next king did evil in the sight of the Lord. And he rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah tore down. God's people desperately needed an uncompromisingly holy king who would reign righteously forever. And we have him. We have such a high priest as this, who is king. He is seated now at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning over all creation as King of kings and Lord of lords. All authority, he's, he says, has been given to him already in heaven and on earth. He has been given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. It goes all the way back to Daniel 7. That's the king that was promised. That's the king we got. We have such a high priest. And that's good news. It's good news that we have such a high priest who sits on his throne. It's good news that there is one who wears a crown in the temple like we read in Zechariah 6. It's the king that was promised. It's the king that we got. We have such a high priest. He has the power to win our hearts. He has the power to rule over us, to govern us, to shape us, to protect us, to provide for us. And he keeps his promises to us. So we have a king seated on his throne who is also a priest. So what's the significance of a priest that sat down? How, how could they be understanding that? What's the significance of that? Well, there were no chairs in the Holy of Holies. You know, there's no sitting around. In the most holy place in the tabernacle and in the temple, priests were busy little beavers, right? Going in and out, their work was never done. They had to offer sacrifices over and 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 over again. Why? Because they worked? No, because they didn't work. If they had, they could have sat down. 
They wouldn't have had to keep doing it, but they did have to keep doing it. Why? To point to their need for a sacrifice that worked. And Jesus is did. And so he sat down. And it's important for us to realize for a lot of reasons, but one of them is this. <clears throat> There's a temptation uh, for a lot of us, for, for mankind in general, men and women, to just be busy with religiosity. To find ways to keep ourselves busy so that we think we're, we're doing all right. And that's what every other religion does. We have to be aware of that. Every other religion is a religion of human achievement. Okay? Christianity alone is the one religion of divine accomplishment. For the Christian, the work is done. So we have to remind ourselves of that so we're not running around trying to merit our standing before God through our performance. Jesus has already done it. How do you know? He sat down. Does this mean there's nothing for us to do? Well, nothing that's going to earn your salvation for you. But seeing as how you have been saved, you should concern yourself with obedience to the one who saved you. And I realize some Christian authors and bloggers today tend to downplay obedience a little bit, that, 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 that worrying about obedience is, is legalism. It's all it can ever be. So it's really important we understand the difference between setting out each day to prove yourself to God and setting out each day to live a life that is pleasing to God. Those two things are not the same. Because see, one looks to the self as the means of pleasing God, and the other is responding in gratitude that Jesus has already pleased God. So trying to earn your standing with God or doing things because you think by doing them you can get God to love you, that's wrong. But so is thinking because Jesus obeyed perfectly, you don't have to. You should want to is the point. And so the desire to please God by doing a little more dying to self today and concerning yourself with how you can love God and love neighbor a little more today than you did yesterday is proof that your faith is genuine. James says so in chapter 2 of his letter. Faith without works is dead. And what he lays out there isn't an addition problem. It's not faith plus works equals salvation. No, the one who is saved by faith will demonstrate that they are saved by their good works. True faith doesn't bring about no works. It brings about good works. But here's what a lack of faith does. Okay? A lack of faith hustles around stacking up bricks, adding to a list of good works so that you can build a fortress of protection against the displeasure of God. That's never going to work. And that's not faith. Well, it is faith. It's faith in the fortress, but not faith in God. It's faith in the crummy little bricks of self-righteousness and works as though they can protect you from God. True faith looks like obedience that's looking for smiles from God and not safety from God. True and faithful obedience looks like looking for smiles from God, not protection from God. Do you see that difference? True faith that comes from knowing the security you already have in Christ looks like obedience out of love and gratitude, not fear and obligation. <clears throat> and that's the kind of faith they have if they are trusting Christ. They don't need to be concerned about getting right with God and fixing their relationship with God. No, Jesus has already done that. That's why the author is saying, that's why he's telling them, don't put your faith in the things and the works that bring you into the presence of God and fix your relationship with him. Those were only ever shadows anyway. Look to the Savior, the high priest who sat down because his work of fixing that relationship is done. It's fixed. It's restored. You have the Father's love because of him. And you will keep the Father's love because of him. And if that's true, who would not want to do what is pleasing to their Father? Right? 
Who would not want to do what is pleasing to their father? That's faithful obedience, motivated by a heart of gratitude. Now, I realize that's not specifically addressed in this passage, but it's worth mentioning because it's the other side of the coin, okay? On the one side, you have obedience that trusts in the obedience, doing the things that God says to do, and then I'll have right relationship with him. It's a faith that relies on the works themselves for the justification. In this case, following the Old Testament system of animal sacrifice by the temple priests in order to get right with God, in order to bring us into his presence. And then on the other side, you have an obedience that trusts in the finished work of Christ. A faith that relies on him for justification and getting right with God. And that's precisely what's in view in this passage. The work of getting you right with God and getting you into his presence is not a work that you can do. It's not a work that the priests can do. It's a work that only Jesus can do, and he's already done it. There's no more work to do. You're not going to be able to add to it. You're not going to be able to improve on it. You're going to rest in it. That's what you're going to do. And really resting in it looks like responding with gratitude. Gratitude that he got it done. That it really worked that it was enough that you are right with God because of Christ's sacrifice for you. <coughs> Excuse me. It worked. That's why he sat down. So we respond with joy and freedom. That's what we have as Christians, joy and freedom. Not freedom to sin. You remember what Paul said about that? You know, does that mean uh, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more in the sense like I should just go on sinning as much as I can because grace? No, may it never be. It's not a freedom to sin, it's a freedom from sin, a freedom to not sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. That grace and our awareness of it is what motivates that obedience from the heart. And it's interesting, a lot of times, you know, we pit law and grace against each other and, and think about how, um, well, if we, if we talk too much grace, then, then we're not, not going to have as much obedience. The opposite is true. The, the better awareness we have, the, the greater appreciation we have for the grace that's been shown to us, the more obedience, not the less. Every high priest offered sacrifices, it says there in verse 3, because the wages of sin is death. That's something we know. We've heard that before. The wages of sin is death. What we also know from Scripture is life is in the blood. Didn't God say that? The life is in the blood. And so blood had to be shed for sin. And all of that blood of the animals that was shed, was shed for sin was symbolic of their need to have that sin removed from them so they could be accepted by God and for him to be able to dwell with them. And the priests that offered those sacrifices had to have something to offer themselves. Did you see that there in the passage? But they couldn't offer themselves, right? They were sinners like us, which is good in the sense that they could relate to us in our sin. They could share in our sufferings and our sorrows. They could sympathize with our weakness, but they couldn't transcend our weakness. And because they couldn't, they were incomplete, didn't get us all the way. They were pictures. They were shadows of our need for a sinless priest who could get us all the way. And so were the animals that they sacrificed, a copy and a shadow, a pattern laid down for us to show us what we needed was blood to atone for sin. The life of the righteous in place of the unrighteous. Man's blood, a perfect, spotless man's blood. And Christ is that perfect sacrificial lamb. He is the sacrifice they needed. Jesus' sacrifice of himself finally ended all the bloodshed. Finally, the blood offered for sin was accepted by God because it was perfect. And there was no more need for any more. It was the blood all the other blood pointed to. So who cares? So what? How's this going to affect me the rest of this week when life gets real again, right? I've got deadlines at work. 
We've got bills to pay diapers to change, laundry to fold, kids to cart around, doctor's appointments to make and go to. Since we have such a great high priest, since he is our forerunner and we are in him, since we are able to go where he goes and he is seated in heaven, we are seated in heaven with him. Your place is guaranteed you have a reservation, an RSVP, at the table of the Lamb on the day of the wedding feast. You think about that. Meditate on that this week and see if it doesn't affect you. See if it doesn't patch up things you've poked holes in. See if it doesn't start on the inside and begin to radiate out of you so it changes the way that you relate to other people. So that, so that it changes the way that you react to the way other people relate to you. Your place is reserved in heaven, seated in heaven with him. And there's a present reality to that too. That we are seated with him in the heavenly places. Sounds strange to us. I'm not making it up. Paul says so in Ephesians 2. He says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Paul could say that like it's already happened, even though Jesus is already up there and we're still down here, because Jesus is there for us. In him, we will be there too, and we are already being represented there now. So listen, if Jesus is that confident about your salvation, you should be too. That's an assurance that you have. So this should be doing in us what the author hopes it's doing in his audience. Are you afraid? Are you uncertain? Do you worry sometimes if this road you're on is, is going to pan out? Are you struggling with believing that those promises belong to you? That they're true? Maybe God makes good on them. Maybe they are true, but are they true for me? Do you worry about that kind of stuff? Are you uncertain about the future? Are you worried about your weakness? Do you feel unsure because you have an awareness of your own sin still and you still carry around the shame and the guilt for all of that? Do you worry about the future in the sense that you're afraid of what might happen or might not happen or might not happen on time or what could happen to you in the process? Are you worried about that stuff? Then look to Jesus where he is. He is seated in heaven for you. You have such a high priest that has taken up your cause and made you acceptable to God. You have a high priest that rules over you as king, that defends you, one who is eternal, one who will never die, one who is completely completely faithful, who will never leave you, will never forsake you. And so how that affects us, we should be able to say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? So let that assurance be yours. Be assured you have such a high priest as this, that if you have believed in him and are trusting in him alone for your salvation, he's already done it. He's already done everything required for you to be reconciled to God, for you to be acceptable in his sight, for all of those blessings to be true. He's done it all. There's nothing left for you to do. He sat down. And here's where we remember all of that in the Lord's Supper. Verse 